So my name is Elson Gibbs. I'm the director of the Center for Teaching Support and Innovation. And on behalf of CTSI and our partners in the Desertal Center for Integrative Thinking, I have the enormous pleasure to welcome you to the 2022 Teaching and Learning Symposium. This year marks our 15th symposium and our second virtual symposium. Um, and we're excited to be here. Thank you for joining us um, and joining us as we celebrate our collective work in teaching and learning at the University of Toronto and as, as we take some time to reflect and, and to start to design for our future. Um, so if we can go to the agenda for this morning, Oh, I'll start. I'll start to hear. Here, this is this is great. So, um, this year, of course, we are again meeting online, and and even though we're gathering in a virtual space again, I, I would like to begin by acknowledging the land on which we live and and work and and where we teach and learn. Um, as a settler of English and Scottish descent myself, I am continually working as a learner on developing my own greater understanding of my responsibility to land and community. And, and in the spirit of reconciliation, I wish to acknowledge the land on which we are privileged to gather as the University of Toronto community. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. And today, this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. And over the next three days, as we learn together and contemplate the possibilities that lay ahead, I hope we'll all have the opportunity to take some time to reflect on, on where we learn, um, and the connections and relationships to this land of the many Indigenous people to whom this remains their home and their meeting place. So here's our plan um, for the, this morning's session. Um, we're going to start with um, uh, some welcome from Professor Mary Gertley, the president of the University of Toronto, who's, who's with us this morning. He's here to welcome us to our conversation. And then we're excited to do something a little different um, this year. And we're going to start our teaching and learning symposium conversation using a design thinking framework. Um, and we'll, a uh, framework to which we'll all be collectively and collaboratively um, collaborating. Uh, so it's now my privilege to welcome Professor Gertler to open the symposium. Thank you so much, Allison. Appreciate uh, the rousing uh, introduction and, and welcome this morning. Well, I want to welcome you all and thank you for joining us today. A special thanks to the Center for Teaching Support and Innovation and the Desertel Center for Integrative Thinking for designing, organizing, and hosting this 15th annual teaching and learning symposium. That's quite a milestone. I want to begin by acknowledging the obvious that it has been a difficult couple of years for all of us. We've had to adjust and that continuously to changing public health conditions and directives. We've worked so hard to create and maintain safe and accessible environments for teaching and learning. And we've largely succeeded, a credit to all of you. The safe and gradual return to our campuses has also been a huge undertaking. And I know we have all been so pleased to see so much life and excitement returning to our campuses in person. So I wanna thank everyone involved in this effort, ensuring the health and safety of our students, staff and faculty could only have been accomplished with the help and dedication of the entire community. And let me specifically acknowledge the work of this teaching and learning community. Over these past two years, your creativity innovation, dedication, and perhaps most of all, the caring that you have shown to our students and to one another have been front and center as we re-envisioned and reimagined our workspaces and instructional methods. The community found new ways to come together and strengthen our commitment to teaching and learning under challenging circumstances. We made an impressive transition from emergency online teaching to high quality remote and hybrid instruction. You ensured that our international students would continue to receive the best possible education under the circumstances, harnessing synchronous, asynchronous, blended, and other means of instruction. We had to rethink how to foster global citizenship and to provide international experiences for our students. And then as we returned to our campuses, 
we had to figure out how best to combine the old and the new. So every aspect of teaching and learning has required your focused attention, your thoughtful reflection, most importantly, a willingness to take risks and try out new ideas. Uh, and, and let's face it, just plain hard work. In so many ways we've had to work together as a community that dare I say, defies gravity. So as you embark upon this 15th annual teaching and learning symposium, let me again say thank you. I'm so proud to be a part of UFT's teaching and learning community. Thank you for everything you've done to support our students, to support one another, and of course, to advance the University of Toronto. The theme of this year's symposium, Designing the Future, could hardly be more timely. The pandemic continues to ebb and flow, two steps forward, one step back, sometimes the opposite. We may well face more challenges ahead as we adapt and adjust to these changing circumstances. And yet we have learned so much since March, 2020, when we first went into lockdown. I think it's important to pause and reflect on our experiences, both positive and negative, and to consider what we might want to retain and build upon as we look to the future, as well as what we wanna leave behind. So. How has our experience these past two years informed our thinking about accessibility and access to learning? What have we learned about systemic racism and other forms of discrimination? And how does our pedagogy both exacerbate and address these pernicious problems? What kinds of innovations in assessment and evaluation can we build upon? How can we improve our experiential and work integrated learning approaches? while leveraging the amazing innovations we've developed to cope with a purely virtual work environment. The shift to remote interaction may also have undermined the social fabric and mutual understanding within our academic communities. So how can we best teach our students to learn from argument, disagreement and difference and to disagree well? Moreover, I think the pandemic has been a potent reminder to all of us that education is about so much more than classes labs and libraries, important as these are. It's also about the social elements, learning from one's peers, encountering a diversity of people, perspectives and ideas, living, studying and working in a new environment or culture and participating in the give and take of debate. So there is an undeniable magic to in-person models of education. Some of these observations were captured in the Times Higher Education Student Pulse Survey uh, which surveyed more than 2,200 students in 120 countries. Uh, the results of which were presented at uh, the World Academic Summit here in Toronto back in September. And he, the survey respondents expressed an overwhelming preference for in-person learning, not just because of the value of in-person pedagogical approaches, but also because of the richness of the entire experience. Well, we know that teaching and learning at U of T are not only about deepening understanding and developing key academic skills in our students, they're also about being there for our students and creating a caring community. And this is another way in which U of T's academic community thrives and excels. Over the next three days, you'll have the opportunity to connect and engage with your colleagues, examining the learning experiences of faculty, students, and, and staff over the past year. This is really an essential part of designing the future. In a few moments, Olivier Saint-Cyr from the Faculty of Information will lead you through some design thinking exercises to address the complex challenges facing our students and educators. These exercises will feed into the concurrent sessions and inform discussions throughout the symposium. So let me conclude where I started by extending my thanks to this community for everything you do as both teachers and learners in support of our students. It's because of your commitment to our students, your commitment to excellence, that U of T is one of the world's truly great universities. Let me wish you all a rewarding and successful 15th annual teaching and learning symposium. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Professor Gertler, for joining us and, and for really, really wonderfully setting the stage for the next three days and, and for the design thinking work that is to come this morning. So thank you so much. Pleasure.
Um, typically at this time, we'd be introducing our keynote speaker, uh, but as Professor Gertler noted this year, at this moment of time feels a little different. And so for our 15th symposium, um, following two years of, of disruption, we, we thought it was time to try something a little different and to give ourselves some space to reflect about where we've been, what we've learned, and, and to think about how this will shape our future. And we're going to put you to work, but it's work we hope you will find fun and creative. And, and we'll, we'll ask you to challenge yourselves to collaborate and, and work together um, using this design thinking framework that we have planned. And whether you're an expert in design thinking or you're brand new to it, as I was just a very short time ago, um, we, we really hope we've created a safe space for you to be creative together. And, and we hope that it'll also give you some inspiration for how you might use design thinking activities, perhaps in one of your classes. Um, as Professor Gertler mentioned, I am so grateful that we have an expert in design thinking to guide us in this work. And it's my absolute pleasure now to introduce you um, to Professor Olivier Sancier. Um, so just a little bit of information about Olivier. He joined the Faculty of Information in 2016, where he's an assistant professor in the teaching stream, and he's also cross-appointed to the Department of Mechanical and Industrial Engineering. And Olivier came to this current position after a number of years in the industry, where he worked on problems in human-computer interaction for many organizations, including IBM, University Health Network, um, Atomic Energy of Canada, and others. He has expertise in human factors, human computer interaction, and user experience. And Olivier, as, as I know well, has an extremely, a deep, deep commitment to student learning. Um, he uses and designs innovative classroom practices that, that emphasize hands-on active learning, project-based learning, studio-based pedagogy. And he oversaw the construction of two um, extremely exciting cutting-edge active learning spaces in the Bissell Building, which both serve as an exploratory sandbox for his teaching research, but they've also transformed teaching and learning more broadly at the Faculty of Information. Uh, Olivier is the 2017 recipient of the Master of Information Student Council Outstanding Instructor Award. He is a 2021 recipient of University of Toronto's Early Career Teaching Award. Um, and I am also, I just, before I, I, I pass to you, Olivia, I also actually have to acknowledge the wonderful team of students that you have brought along with um, you today. So many of you will be meeting a student from the iSchool as, as we work this morning, and, and we are so grateful that they have come to support our work. Thank you so much to that team. And maybe before I pass it to you, I'll also just add a brief personal note. Um, I just have to say what a delight it has been to work with Olivier these past few months as we've been preparing for this symposium. Um, he, he is furiously committed to creating innovative and transform transformative um, learning experience for his students. And, and he is most definitely unflinchingly passionate about design thinking. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I, I was new to design thinking before working with Olivier, and, and from firsthand experience, I can attest that Olivier's energy and passion has made me a devoted enthusiast, and I'm so excited to begin. So, Olivier, I will pass to you. Thank you so much, and welcome, everyone. It's a, truly an honor to be here. I mean, uh, I was asked to do this, I think, back in October and November of 2021, and I, I became really, really excited about the project right away because uh, the plan from the get-go was to make a fun, interactive symposium. And I'm hoping uh, this is what we're going to be able to deliver here for you today. I do believe that Megan uh, has a few slides to go through before I get started. So I will let uh, Megan Burnett, which is the Associate Director of CTSI. Um, I think, I believe these are housekeeping slides and then we will, I'll get started after. We're gonna do them at the end, Olivier. Thank oh, you for the introduction. The end. Okay, Hello great. everyone and welcome, but yeah, we'll leave those until the end. So whenever great. you're ready. Okay, so let's get this show started. I hope people can see my slides. Yes, excellent. So welcome to, uh, again, to the 2022 uh, 20, 15th Annual Teaching and Learning Symposium. Uh, thank you so much, Allison, for the great introduction. It's 
as Alison mentioned, we've been uh, working on this project since uh, October of 2021. And it's been a delight working with all the CTSI folks on planning this. Uh, it's fairly um, new as a format for the symposium. So I'm gonna walk you through the format and uh, we'll, we'll go right into it. So uh, as um, Allison mentioned, I am an assistant professor teaching stream in the Faculty of Information. I joined U of T uh, in the Faculty of Information in 2016, but I've been around U of T since 2002 in various different roles, students. Then I was a sessional lecturer in engineering and computer science. I do recognize quite a few names from the participant list from uh, former colleagues of mine in computer science and engineering. So uh, if I have worked with you in the past, uh, I, I welcome you to, uh, to this symposium. It's great to see you around. Um, and um, I'm the liaison for the user experience program, uh, which is a concentration or an area of focus in our master's of information degree. So today you'll see many of uh, our students uh, and also throughout the symposium as well tomorrow and Friday coming and help. I have a team of very dedicated volunteers who have accepted to uh, come and um, provide support uh, when we go into breakout rooms, as well as some CTSI folks also are providing support for uh, throughout this exercise. I do teach in areas uh, that are called human factors, HF, human computer interaction, and user interface design and user experience. I've done this for about 16 years. And so my uh, teaching is about designing good experiences when people have to interact with technology, services, and products. Uh, but I try to do the same when I design my classroom because I always tell my students, if I'm teaching you the best principles of how to design good experiences when you interact with technology, I would be very hypocrite to not use these principles myself to design the best teaching experiences when you have to interact with me and your colleagues in my classes and my courses. So I'd like you to reflect on that today as I go through uh, some of the, some of the um, exercise throughout the symposium. We're trying to collect data today on how to design the futures and you're gonna be a huge portion of this data collection. You're gonna help, you're gonna do some interactive, active learning exercise. But everything you learn today and you do today in this opening plenary, you can actually do for your own courses in your own classes as well, so which is very exciting. So um, the symposium uh, will be um, using this design thinking framework and it's really over the next three days. So this morning we're gonna do um, the opening plenary and we're gonna be talking about collecting data and looking at what are some of the opportunities to design for the future. Tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. we're gonna have a breakout session which is gonna use the data that we have collected today. So again, this, more, this afternoon from one to four o'clock, I have a team of student volunteer who are gonna help me crunch all this data, converge it and summarize it in a nice way so that it's ready for tomorrow morning. And um, we're gonna have a one and a half hour tomorrow uh, design thinking session. And many of you are registered in that session to keep, to keep going on what does that mean designing for the future? And then again, Thursday afternoon, I'm gonna have a team of students uh, helping me crunch all the data from the Thursday morning session so that it's ready for the closing plenary in um, where we're gonna present some of these ideas and some of these thoughts around designing for the future to a panel of university administrators uh, who are gonna comment and, um, and give us their opinions on what that is. So the, the the symposium is really, the theme of the symposium really spread throughout the, the three days, um, which is uh, a good thing, <laughs> but it can also be a scary thing in a sense that um, one of the things that you'll discover and you'll, you'll have to appreciate is that this whole process is very organic. So I don't know what I'm gonna get out of this morning session <laughs> because we're gonna try it all together. And we're gonna see this afternoon what we got out of this. 
and then same thing with tomorrow morning and tomorrow afternoon. So um, it, it's, it, the, there's a lot of excitement in knowing that we all gonna generate this together, but um, it's, we, we just don't know. Like it's like this, the design thinking framework is meant to address wicked problem and these problems are solved with the participation of users and uh, we'll see where it goes, right? So that's a little bit of the scary part on my end, making sure that we get somewhere on Friday afternoon, but I'm sure with a dedicated uh, bunch of um, teachers and professors and uh, students that are coming all around the universities from different departments, it will be all good. So our agenda for today is um, to go through uh, an introduction of design thinking, which is gonna follow this slide. Then we're gonna go through our first exercise, which is the data generation. And then we're gonna take a break. And then we're gonna play back. Playback meaning is looking at what we've generated all together. So we're gonna look back at the data that we've collected. Based on that data, we are gonna to go to a second exercise and we're gonna look at what are some of the opportunities for designing for the future out of this, um, out of this data set. And we're gonna play it back again. And that will be the conclusion of our day today. Great. So I'm just gonna put a link. I'm gonna put several links in the chat as I speak because some of you may be interested in archiving some of the resources I'm talking about. So the first resource I'm gonna put in the chat is the introduction to design thinking, which you can download here by clicking the link that I just um, added in here. So, uh, and this is actually a book that, from a book that we do have at the University of Toronto in the library system. So you can also download it from there. So design thinking at its core uh, can be construed as a creative problem solving approach. So this is what we're gonna ask you today, right? We're gonna ask you to be creative, to think about what does that mean designing for the future of education? More completely, uh, it's a systematic and collaborative approach for identifying and creatively solving problems. And the word collaborating is very important here. When I do design thinking in my classes with my students, uh, there's a lot of collaboration. There's a lot of teamwork. There's a lot of people bouncing ideas from another, et cetera, et cetera. And this is what we're hoping to, to create today, this kind of creative, thoughtful environment where we're going to put you into breakout rooms and you're going to be able to share some thoughts and ideas and work together. As I explained before, uh, design thinking is a very non-linear process. So you start the process and you just, you don't necessarily know what you're gonna get at the end. It's meant to be organic and participatory. So people, users are the main sources of your data. And then you engage with them to try to understand and empathize with your users. And you have to be willing to accept that um, this, this might not lead you to the path that you thought it would, right? So it's very nonlinear. Um, and and that's the, to me, that's the exciting part about it. There's always a discovery aspect to it. It is very people-centric. It's a shift from product and technology-centric to primarily focusing on value experiences, the needs of people and empathizing with people. So, and these are the principles that I teach in my classes. It's very cross-disciplinary and collaborative, which is amazing because now we have people coming to this opening plenary from all kinds of different uh, places in the universities, right? Which is amazing because uh, you're gonna be put in breakout rooms with people from different disciplines and different backgrounds and different faculties and maybe what they think the designing for the future should be is not necessarily what you think designing for the future should be based on your discipline and background, but you're gonna to get to exchange that and collaborate and use a variety of background and training 
to get different perspective. So that's, it's a very important aspect of design thinking is bringing all these different perspective and diverse teams. Design thinking is also very holistic and integrative. So design thinkers are, should be able to consider relationship, interaction and connection between ideas. So there's a, you'll see today when we start these exercises, there's gonna be lots and lots of ideas floating around. Uh, it, you'll be amazed of how much, how many ideas people can generate in a matter of 20, 25 minutes uh, once, once you put them all together to collaborate. So design thinkers have to be able to see all the relationship and interaction between these different ideas. Um, you have to be comfortable when you do design thinking with ambiguity. And this is um, related to what I've mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, where uh, a lot of the process is actually organically growing as you put people through different activities and different exercises. So design thinking is best suited to address ambiguous and complex problem. In the field of user experience, we often call these problem wicked problems. Uh, you can Google that if you want to find out a little bit more. But these the kind of problems that don't necessarily have a very precise defined solution where, you know, it, it could go in many directions. So think about it now. We're asking you to, to think about designing for the future of higher level education. Like how much more of a wicked problem can we get than that one, right? I don't have an answer. Uh, I have some ideas, but I don't have an answer. Uh, and it's, 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 it's a very complex uh, problem to solve. So it requires flexibility and comfort with ambiguity because you are going to discover some things as you do these exercise. And um, you have to be comfortable with, with, with that discovery process and being flexible. Uh, it's multi-model communication, so we use verbal cues, visual cues, tactile cues. Technically, when I do this in person in my classroom, I use a lot of sticky notes and markers and whiteboards. Today, we're going to use digital sticky notes and digital whiteboards, so it's going to be um, a slightly different approach, but there's different modality of communication when you do design thinking. And finally, uh, it's a willingness to test some ideas and concepts and prototype and to always uh, um, to be comfortable with uh, the idea of failing to some extent and learning from your failures. So it's a growth mindset. So this, if you've been looking at the symposium introduction page, you've seen this uh, graphic, I'm sure, many times. This is where um, we use like um, something similar to the infinity symbol in mathematics to show that design thinking is iterative and it's never completed and it's never ending process where we go through a discovery phase, a define phase, a create phase and an evaluate phase. And the graphic is also uh, showing you some other aspect where um, the space between discovery and define on the vertical axis is much wider then if you go into the middle of the graphic, which much much narrower, and the idea behind that is converging and diverging. When you start design thinking, your ideas are all over the place. But as you define them, they become more and more um, precise. And then so you converge your thoughts. Then when you create something, you again diverge. And then you, you refine your thoughts and your creation and your prototypes by evaluating. So this there's this aspect of... Uh, blowing up and going 30,000 feet versus being uh, a little bit more precise and defined. So today we're gonna look at the discovery phase quite a bit and we're gonna try to understand the user's context. We're gonna try to gain some empathy with our users and our users today are gonna be you, the participants of the symposium. So what is your context of teaching in the last two years? How would you define uh, what you liked, what you didn't like, what you want to keep, what you don't want to keep, what you want to look further at, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to go, this first exercise of the day is going to be a huge discovery exercise where we're going to generate a whole bunch of data. Um, uh, that's, and you'll see how much we can generate. You'll, you'll be surprised again. Then we're going to go into the define. And the define is going to be half today and half tomorrow morning. 
So today we're going to look at defining opportunities. Tomorrow morning, we're going to look at defining ideas. And we also uh, are going to get some insights from all of this data. And we're going to try to make sense of it. And we're going to try to converge it and see. So what are some of the themes? What are some of the big points and big data, basically, that comes out of all these single pieces of data that we've been collecting? We're going to touch slightly creation on if you come to tomorrow morning session, but that would be really the next step is to implement some of these ideas. So we're going to define the ideas. We're going to start thinking about how could we implement them. But obviously, as you understand, we're not going to be able to revamp all of our teaching tomorrow morning and tomorrow afternoon. And by Friday, we have brand new courses up and running and new ways of teaching and we've designed for the future. The creative part is actually the part that looks at what you've defined and experience and prototypes and test and evaluate. And that could be spread out over several months or even a year or two in a context of academic because courses are offered every year or so, right? So, uh, but we will generate ideas uh, tomorrow morning and we will look at how to implement these ideas. And of course, if you were to implement these ideas, you would actually generate um, evaluate these ideas and test them. And this is where I'm hoping some of you will come out of this symposium with a whole bunch of ideas that you can implement in your teaching and evaluate them and, and play with them uh, in the next few months or year. Okay, so I'm just looking here. So here's a typical design thinking journey that you can take and you can embrace. You can see there's several different steps. It's much more complex than this four buckets that I just talked about um, in, the last, uh, in the last few minutes. Um, this is typically what I teach to my students. And uh, there's lots of different methods and principles. Uh, today, I'm giving you kind of a condensed version. <laughs> We're going to look at a few of these things. But I just want you to understand that uh, design thinking can actually be a much more complex process and a much more longer process. And if you're interested in uh, knowing how this, this entire framework could be applied to uh, higher head, then please uh, feel free to connect with me. I'll, I'll be happy to, uh, to talk to you more about that. Okay, just checking here, everything's good. Okay, great. So we're going to move into our first phase of design thinking, which is discover. And in order to discover something, we got to get some thoughts together and we got to get some data flowing and going and some, some um, uh, we, we got to go to users and um, get some information and we got to start interacting with, with ideas and, and uh, pri preliminary data sets. So research often kicks out a design thinking process. So uh, if you look at many uh, different design thinking efforts done in industry or in even in, in, in different fields out there, you'll often see that doing research is, is the first step because discovery involves starting with, with a question or some, some aspect that you wanna know about. And then you find out some answers to some of these, some of these questions that you have, right? Uh, in design thinking, we often collect data from what we call the representative users. And this is very important. Um, I, I, I tell my student this word about like, you know, a hundred times a semester. Uh, representative users, users that are actually involved and are actually relevant to the project that you're studying. So today we're studying designing for the future of higher education. So you're going to be our users. Uh, you are professors and some of you might be also PhD students. So we want to know, um, we want to know what you think about uh, this future of, of higher ed education. So Typically, uh, I like to collect data in a studio approach, uh, very collaborative, cooperative, very hands-on as well. Uh, I give my students often very challenging activities that they have to solve. And uh, it's, it's good to see their face at the beginning, their faces and say, well, I don't know, I, I don't understand. Like I, 
is perfect. <laughs> you don't know, you don't understand, that's good. <laughs> that means you need to keep digging and you need to keep pursuing and you need to, to keep discovering basically. We're in this discovery phase, right? And of course, we're going to provide you with guidance to do this. Like I don't leave my student alone <laughs> for like uh, hours without guidance. Today, we're going to provide you with guidance as well. So this is what it looks like when we do it in our class. It's, uh, it's an amazing uh, um, journey for the students. I, I love to do things in, uh, to get the students working and to be very tactile, sticky notes, whiteboard. I imagine myself right now, all of us in the big huge Des Hotel room at Rotman, every table has a bunch of, a pack of sticky notes and a bunch of papers and markers on the table. And then I give you the go ahead and you start interacting with the stickies and all that, uh, all that tactile hands-on experience, which is so valuable. But like many of you in the last um, two years, I've had to change my teaching and uh, we use a lot of digital tools now to do this. And it's completely doable with digital technology. So this is what we're going to experience today. When I generate data uh, in the classroom, like the picture that I just showed, there are two very important principles that I teach my student to follow. Uh, because working in group, as you may know, <laughs> as educators, is very challenging um, when you put people in a group uh, some people uh, tend to have a louder voices. They tend to take over the conversation. Some people don't collaborate as much, don't participate. So equal voice at the table is very important to me. I always ask my student to work solo first. And this is what I'm going to ask you today as well. Then you share your ideas amongst your group members. By working solo first, you take time yourself to generate some ideas and some data and some thoughts. When I put you then in a group, you can champion each other and at least everyone has something to contribute because they've all worked solo first to actually contribute to the group. If I put you in a group right away and I ask you to start talking, there's a few people who will talk. There's a few people who won't talk. So give a chance to everybody first and then champion each other. Very important. Another very important principle in design thinking is quantity over quality. I know it sounds very uh, maybe uh, not intuitive or contradictory, but remember what I told you before about convergence and divergence. When you diverge, when you actually are in the generative process and the discovery process, it's better to be driven by quantity. It's better to do what I call a brain dump. It's like you just dump all your ideas on paper. You know, you generate this data, you, you put your thoughts on paper, you actually empty your brain into this whiteboard or these sticky notes. Um, that's, that's what I encourage people to do. Don't be inhibited by, oh, maybe this is not a good idea, or maybe this is not a good thought, or maybe this is not enough quality. No, just throw it in, throw it in the pot, throw it in the mix. Then don't forget that design thing after diverging, there's converging and converging is actually where you're going to start seeing the quality emerging out of quantity because you're going to group things together. You're going to start thematizing theme, things. You're going to start naming your, your themes. You're going to say, oh, this chunk of ideas, they're all related to one another. Let's give them a name and a theme and let's put them aside. You're going to start organizing your thoughts, but without quantity, you cannot do, get to that quality. So quantity first over quality, quality will emerge out of quantity. So these are two driving principles that I teach my students when we do data generation uh, in a group. So today we're going to use Miro, which is digital board, um, which is a, um, a whiteboarding, digital whiteboarding system. And it has digital sticky notes and digital dots and digital forms and all of that. And this is what we're gonna be using to do this design thinking exercise. So here's the second link I'm gonna put in the chat. Uh, if you wanna look at the chat right now, and I'm gonna share my screen with optimization for sound and, um, and videos and what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a three-minute introductory video to help 
how Miro works. It's fairly simple, but anyhow, I wanted to give you a sort of a baseline introduction. If you want to listen to it on your own, again, the link is in the chat, so you don't have to listen through it through Zoom if your internet connection is, is not optimal, uh, optimal um, for, um, for Zoom. And then once we have an introduction tomorrow, then we'll get started. Hi, in this video, I'm gonna go over the basics of using Miro. Miro is a great digital whiteboard app that allows you to run workshops remotely. And it has everything that you would need like sticky notes and voting dots. And I'm gonna show you the basics of how to use it right now. So this is an example of a Miro board and you can even get started without creating an account if someone shared a link with you. And this is what you would see when you first open it up or something like this. So I'm just going to dismiss this getting started guide and take you over the five basics that you really need to know to use Miro proficiently. So the first one is panning around, which just means knowing how to move around the board, left and right, up and down. And to do that, if you're on a trackpad on a laptop, you simply scroll uh, in any direction to move in that direction. If you're on a computer using a mouse or a keyboard, you just hold the space bar and you see this hand icon and then you can click and grab to move around. The second thing you need to know is how to zoom in and out. That will make it easier for you to read something that is small or zoom out to see the entire board. Again, if you're on a laptop, you can just pinch to zoom in and out just like you would on your smartphone. If you're on a computer with a mouse and keyboard, uh, you can just scroll uh, on your mouse wheel and that should zoom in and out. Additionally, you can hover over this area here near the bottom right and click the plus button to zoom in and the minus button to zoom out. The third thing you need to know is how to edit a sticky note. If you're part of a workshop, then chances are you'll be working a lot with sticky notes. So to edit a sticky note, all you need to do is double click and then start typing words. And this is where zooming in and out becomes very useful so that you can make the text larger and focus on the sticky note that you're typing. The fourth thing you should know is how to move objects around. So like sticky notes or voting dots, and to do that, you simply click and drag to move the element. So you can move a sticky note like this, or you can move an image like this. And that's pretty much it. The last thing that's useful for you to know is how to use the raise hand feature. That way, if you're working with a facilitator, you can let them know that you need help. And the way you do that is from near the top right over here, you click on reactions, then you click raise hand. And you can lower it once you're done. And as a bonus sixth thing you should know, if you do something accidentally and want to undo it, you can simply click the undo button near the top left or just press Command Z or Control Z, depending on your computer, to undo that action. So those five things are really everything you need to get started using Miro. Thank you for watching and I hope this helps you get started with Miro. See you next time. Hi, in this video... Great. So again, um, the video link, the link to the video is in the chat. If some of you want to rewatch the video or um, you're not sure at some point in time, uh, you can always click back on that link. Uh, it's a fairly simple system to use. However, being any technological system, <laughs> there could always be some glitches. And I'm sure all of you know what I'm talking about because you've all been teaching with technology in the last few, uh, few years. So that's why I have an amazing team of Masters of Information student volunteer and CTSI student volunteer who are going to visit the breakout rooms and make sure that all the interaction and all the uh, all, all your uh, you, what you're supposed to do in your breakout room is going well. And if you have questions, you can raise your hand. We'll have a few student volunteers. Uh, on standby in the main room that are ready to join breakout rooms at any point in time. So I really want to acknowledge my student. Um, they're just amazing student. In my opinion, you cannot be a great educator and a great professor without amazing students. And I, I always uh, credit uh, a lot of my um, students' effort and commitment and, uh, and passion to part of part of my success because uh, without the students, I would not be able to do what I do. So um, yeah. So exercise one, we're gonna get started now, is 
a data generation exercise. We're gonna have three questions and some of you already seen the questions because they were provided on the link to the teaching and learning symposium on the website. We're gonna have three questions. We're gonna get you to work individually for seven minutes. So what I encourage you to do right now, uh, wherever you are, is you could do this in many different ways. You can open up a Word document or Google Doc, a notepad, a text edit if you're on a Mac, whatever you want, and you can type some of your thoughts in there when we get started, right? If you have a whiteboard at home or a pack of sticky notes at home and you really want to experience a tactile feeling, you can also grab your, your marker and your stickies or a piece of paper and you can draw some ideas and write some ideas down on actually physical paper and, and, and stickies. Um, so we're going to do this for seven minutes individually. So once you have your data in whatever form it is, in whatever format it is, I'm gonna put you into breakout rooms for 30 minutes, and then we're gonna work with Miro, and then we're gonna sort of start converging and putting all of our data together. Then we'll take a break for 15 minutes after that, because I'm sure you'll need to relax for a few, for a few minutes, and then we'll do some playback. We just, we'll look at what we've done. So the question are, and I'm gonna put them back on the screen, so don't worry. It uses a, a start, stop, continue type of framework. Looking at the last two years of teaching in the context of a pandemic and having to have revamped a lot of your teaching, what are you leaving behind? What are some of the things that you say, you know what? I don't wanna do this anymore. I don't wanna touch that. What are you taking forward? Because I'm sure some of you have developed and worked on some great things and you're like, wow, I could use this now, even though we're back in person. So what are you taking forward? And what are some of the things you wanna explore further? You wanna go into more and you say, you know what, like in the next year, in the next couple of years, I'd like to explore this further. I'd like to get experiment on my teaching uh, a little bit more with that. So uh, there's a group of students that started their master's degree in the fall of 2020. I have never taught these students in person until February of 2022, which is when we came back from reading week, our faculty came back from, for, for in-person teaching after reading week of this semester. So they had had courses with me and they've had their entire user experience education online. So what I decided to do on the first class, on the first, hour that they were back is to run this exercise. And this, these are actual pictures of the exercise that we ran in the classroom. Uh, this was the week after reading week in February. And we had a lot of fun running this exercise. I asked from a student's point of view, right? What are you leaving behind? What are you taking forward? And what are you looking for and want to explore further? And you can see here all the students working in our studio. This is the individual time period uh, where they, they took seven minutes to generate the data. And this is uh, snapshots of the data that was generated on sticky notes uh, and some of the ideas that uh, floated around um, some of that session. And I'll show you more pictures later. But uh, it, it was a great exercise to do with the students, given the fact that it was the first time we all saw each other in person. We were so accustomed to seeing each other on Zoom and we, uh, we kind of knew-ish, quote unquote, each other, but uh, it's a very tight group of students, the UX concentration. But uh, when, they, when we all came back in person, we're like, you know what? Before I start teaching, let's just take a moment to reflect on what we've just done in the last year and a half in, for your UX program. So I'm going to, give me one second here, stop this timer. And I'm gonna give you seven minutes to work individually right now. <laughs> I'm gonna leave this slide on the screen. Uh, what are you leaving behind? What are you taking forward? What do you wanna explore? Quantity over quality at this point, in whatever format you want, electronically or on paper, it doesn't matter. 
Great. We are back. It, very strange again to do this online because normally when you do this in person, you see all the people like generating their sticky notes at their table and you, you kind of get a sense right away of the energy that's going into the, into the, the data generation process, right? Um, but, you know, it is what it is. And um, I hope you've had a good seven minutes to think about these three questions and generate some data for uh, the remaining of the activity. So in the remaining of the activity, we're gonna do the following. So first, we're gonna give you a URL for Miro to, um, to go online. I'm not gonna do this now because people are gonna to get too excited and they're just gonna go right away and <laughs> they're not gonna look at the instruction anymore. So, um, we are then going to start converging and looking at our sticky notes uh, together. Uh, and right now I'm hearing we have breakout rooms of four to five people plus one volunteer. So that's actually very good uh, because it's small groups and we can get a lot of discussions going. Yes, Alexandra, one thing I've learned, uh, there's a comment in the chat, you know as well. One thing I've learned is that Running these exercises with students or fully grown adults, professors, actually makes no difference. <laughs> People get excited very quickly and they want to get into it. Um, <laughs> so um, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you to use the top template. So you'll see the Miro board, and I'll show you in a few seconds. The Miro board has 50 different boards in it. Uh, I'm gonna get you to work on the board that corresponds to your breakout room numbers. And your breakout room number is always shown at the top of the Zoom breakout room. For example, room one works with board number one, room two with board number two, et cetera, et cetera. This is important. You zoom in on your board and this is your board for the remaining of the session. Use the top templates and start generating your digital sticky notes. Merge them together. You can remove the duplicates or put them close by to one another. And you can start grouping things if you have time towards the end by salient themes, like a few chunks of sticky notes that are related to one another and you kind of move them all together and you group them. So this is what it looks like on Miro, the template, leaving behind, taking forward and explore further. And you're gonna start populating this with some sticky notes. So again, I promised you more pictures. So when we do this in the classroom in person, we have portable whiteboards, which are fairly light. Um, and I ask students, so go grab a whiteboard, bring it to your table and start grouping and start looking at uh, your, um, your stickies and really discuss, like this is the time to, to go from the quantity to the quality, right? So that's, that's the important part. So this is what it looks and sound like. It's funny. It's line office hours I just love the energy when I do this because I can see everybody's participating. That whole principle, again, of equal voice at the table, as much as you can, obviously, there's always different personalities, I acknowledge that, but also championing one another, right? And making sure that, um, that the students are really contribute, making, putting forward their individual contribution and then championing one another. This is very, very uh, important. So here's another, uh, another example of how this worked. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you the Miro board. I'm sure you're all excited to start. And this is what it looks like. You could see here that there are, you know, 50 boards. I think we're going to need about 30 or, or 35. I was, I'm, I was hearing like, so um, we're not going to need all 50 just in case. And you can zoom in into your board. Let's say you're in room number one. 
you can zoom in to the board for room one. And the toolbar here at the left-hand side is the digital sticky notes. And you can actually grab a sticky note of whatever color you want and put it here and start typing your text. And so you can digitally add your own individual contribution to this board. And um, you can also have a peek of what the neighboring breakout room is doing if you really want to, but <laughs> that's, I'll leave that up to you. Uh, one of the thing you'll notice when, um, one of the thing you'll notice when everyone joins the board is you'll see everyone's cursor. For those of you who are logged in tomorrow because you have an account, it will show your name next to your cursor. For others, it will show an invited visitor. This could be quite annoying with 100 people all together in one room or 130 people all together. So there is an option here at the top, uh, this one here, it says hide collaborators cursors. So if you don't want to see everybody's cursors, but you only want to see yours, then you can hide, and this is done at an individual level. So it won't hide it for everybody, just for you. So it's an individual preference, right? The other thing I would like to point out to you as well is there will be a timer. So I'm gonna put a 30 minute timer, which is gonna show up right here. So anytime you wanna have a quick peek at the top right corner of the screen, you'll see a timer and we have 30 minutes to do this exercise. Oh la la, this is gonna be fun. I'm excited. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a couple of things. First, I'm gonna go ahead and give you the link to the board, which is right in the chat. Give me one second here. Okay, so that's the link to the board. Second is I'm gonna paste in the chat the instruction for this activity because once we go into breakout rooms, you'll lose the main display from the slides, the main room slides. So these are the instructions. <laughs> I love Christine's comments from <laughs> everyone. <laughs> oh, this is great. So you have the, the Miro board at the top as the URL, and you have the instructor, the instruction for the first exercise. I hope everybody understand what uh, you need to do. I'm going to close the display here. I'm going to open uh, the breakout rooms are ready or no, Ariana, are they ready or? Uh, yeah, the room's ready. Can, thank you. That's great. Welcome back, everyone. I did visit a few rooms here and there while taking care of some logistic uh, back and forth between the main room and some breakout rooms. And uh, I'm just, again, like, as I told you before, uh, if you look at um, the, I'm just gonna share my screen here. If you look at this Miro board right now, you'll be maybe, if not, I mean, as amazed as I am to look at all the data that has been generated. Everybody had great participation. Um, again, if you translate this in the physical world, Every table in the hotel hall would have like, you know, either at the center of the table, people would put their sticky notes or would have like a whiteboard or some kind of large sheet of paper with all the stickies on there and uh, grouping their stickies together. But here we have it digitally and we see all these different boards that were uh, filled and complete. So that is actually a lot of data if you think about it, like, there's a lot of data that has been collected here, but because it's a design thinking kind of framework and we worked all on it collaboratively, uh, we were able to produce a whole bunch in just like what, like 37 minutes or so, 40 minutes. So um, normally I would lock this board so that people don't uh, modify it, but I won't lock it because we have another activity after the break. However, I wanna point out to everybody that at the end of today's plenary, the board will be locked, but will remain for view only as long as CTSI wants it to be uh, available online for read only and view only. So if you keep the URL of that board, which don't forget, I will repost on the chat or if you bookmark it, you know, and then a, a month from now or a week from now, you want to go back or you want to browse around the different rooms and see what 
because it may spark some ideas and some some thoughts for your own teaching and your own courses, right? So all this data that we are accumulating over the next three days in the symposium will be archived and will stay on my row for read only and view only purpose. So that's exciting uh, in my opinion. So, okay, but I'm sure now you're all uh, tired uh, because we've done a whole lot of stuff, right? <laughs> in the last, uh, in the last um, few, uh, few, few minutes. So what we'll do is if you want to keep working on the Miro board, hey, you don't need to be in breakout rooms for that. You can still you can still keep working on it in the background. I'm not going to stop you. But in the meantime, what we'll do is we'll take a 15 minute break to allow everybody to get up their chair, go get a drink, uh, you know, make sure you stretch and you sort of refresh your mind because when we come back, we're going to use all this data and we're going to keep converging and keep pushing forward. So I look forward to see you in 15 minutes. Okay, let's restart. Last one, uh, one hour left and one more activity, which is perfect timing. So typically uh, when we do design thinking, we have this idea of a playback. So we built in playbacks uh, throughout the design thinking process. And playbacks are basically a way for participants um, to just tell a story. Basically, it's a storytelling exercise. And I get my student to do this a lot in class. If you talk to any of my students, they will tell you how much emphasis there is on storytelling your design accomplishment or your data collections or your, anywhere you are in the design thinking process. So this is where I would get to the students and say, okay, well, you know, put up your board up and tell me the story of this data. What is this data saying? And what categories did you come up with? How did you classify it? How did you arrange it? Um, what, what do you think you're getting out of this data set? So you have a, a picture here of some examples of uh, uh, you know, playback data that was generated as part of that exercise that I did with my student in, in mid-February. But today, um, I'm going to show you a, a video um, put together by CTSI. And what we did is between um, the end of 2021 and the beginning of 2022, we, ran a, we went around campus and we interviewed uh, faculty members, students, um, about, and we asked them the same three questions. What are you leaving behind? What are you uh, taking forward with you? And um, uh, give me one second here. I'll just look at the Miro board after. Like it's, I see some uh, some some things in the chat, but uh, we'll try to address that problem. Sorry, Sorry yeah, that. this is Derek. I just want to pop in. I think you're only sharing the application, so it's blacking out anything else on your screen that you're showing. For your screen share right now. Okay. Is this better? There we go. Yep, that's it. Sorry about that. Um, here's the pictures that I wanted you to. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's uh, Thank you, Derek. Thank you so much. Uh, here's the picture that I wanted you to see about how the students do playback in class. That's the idea. And so what I'm gonna show you right now is a video done by CTSI that was um, where we went around campus and collected some thoughts from faculty members and students around what are you leaving behind? What are you taking for? And what do you wanna explore further? And so this will sort of act as our playback and sort of give us some more thoughts also around these three questions. So I'm gonna go in the chat here and put the video in the chat just in case, again, people wanna archive it or they wanna to listen to it on their own. I'm gonna make sure my screen is shared for sound and video. We'll get started. Whoops.
I think what I'm leaving behind are the large group dynamic theory-based kind of information dump sessions where everyone's sitting in a crowded lecture hall with very limited opportunity for interactivity. One thing that I'm leaving behind is this concept of normal. So if the lecture format seems to have worked last year, it may not work this year. As an educator, I'm leaving behind some old techniques that now looking back and having to overcome some of the challenges we've experienced during the pandemic, I realize maybe there were weren't the most effective uh, ways of teaching students and interacting with students. I think one of the major roadblocks that was kind of constantly holding me back during the two years of online learning was feeling like an imposter, so imposter syndrome. I would often find myself kind of plagued by self-doubt and this unshakable feeling that I was a fraud, partly because I felt so far removed from the academic learning environment I was accustomed to. I recently read Kate Holmes' books, Mismatch, How Inclusion Shapes Design, uh, published up by MIT Press. And one of the chapters is titled, There's No Such Thing as Normal. Holmes writes that design, quote, needs to work across a wide range of human diversity. But that's easier said than done. People can be highly unpredictable. So how do we design for so much complexity? end quote. And one way to design for so much complexity is to include your students in the design process. Be intentionally transparent in your design and avoid assumptions. I think all the fluctuating changes that I've faced throughout my university experience has helped me learn how to adapt to different learning styles and environments that I may not have been used to before. I've also transitioned kind of from depending on physical environments like libraries to kind of virtual spaces like study hubs. I'm taking forward the perspective of accessibility. Something I've noticed is a lot of the teaching facility at USC has been really open to recording their lectures and making their notes available, making material available. I really think it's so interesting to see how we were able to mix in-person and virtual things, even just like increase accessibility and increase reach. For me as a student, an older student, a student, student with learning disability um, and studying engineering, both these things were actually very, very helpful. I'm a statistics teaching assistant, so taking mathematical concepts into a virtual realm was not an easy task. So definitely taking forward new skills and new technologies that I have learned how to use or incorporated into my teaching. All of the taped lectures, that's I think going to be a really good resource going forward. So now that we all have these taped resources, it gives a lot of flexibility to try and do these flipped classroom techniques. Even the use of things like a writing pad, which I had never really used before in my teaching, has been huge in terms of being able to draw things out and communicate things to students that I would have been using a, a chalkboard or a whiteboard for. I think a lot of things um, the pandemic has taught us, I think are actually quite useful and actually pushed us forward and things maybe we were dragging our feet on, sort of like the use of technology, how technology can help with access and so how technology can leverage like community building and things like that. I hope we will take forward. One thing that I want to explore further is actually something that was brought on by uh, a recent workshop that Flower Darby had held. In this workshop, Flower Darby talked about how when we enter a physical classroom, we often think about how we turn on the lights, we turn on the screen projectors, we turn on our laptops, and it's as though we're turning on this teaching and learning space for ourselves and our learners. So one thing I'm taking um, away from this and that I want to explore is how do I turn on my classroom when it's online or in person or a combination of both? I think finding a way to balance kind of the social and academic environment of in-person settings with the kind of ease and convenience of online learning would be really helpful and conducive to a lot of different learning styles. I kind of noticed that after months of hoping to return to in-person classes on my first day back, when I settled in and kind of heard my professor give the first in-person talk, I found myself missing some of the features that I benefited from during our online virtual experience. For example, the chat box that helped me kind of 
ask questions as soon as they came up in my head rather than kind of wait to the end of the lecture. However, I do believe that there are a lot of benefits to in-person classes as well that are kind of hard to replicate online, such as kind of being able to more closely and more personally interact with my professors and peers and kind of build that relationship. There are benefits to having, for instance, recorded lectures, virtual office hours. Some students don't feel comfortable, for instance, asking questions during class, but they're they're comfortable doing it through a chat form or, like I said, in a one on one virtual capacity with an instructor or a TA. I, I just think it moves things in the direction of more dynamic learning. It moves things in the direction of, of more community building. I think there's got to be a way to do this hybrid thing rather than just the online thing in a way that still meets people where they're at, right? Allows them the flexibility, but allows you to develop the interpersonal connections that ultimately are what makes it most successful. I would um, want to explore how administrators, profs, and instructors can improve their, their teaching and connection to students by continuing to listen to students' feedback um, and input regarding their learning experience. The need to encompass community building and more reliable support systems is very important like now more than ever just reinforcing the importance of community outreach and especially mental health will often i think make this solitary and kind of lonely academic experience a little bit better um, and help students and all community members thrive Wait, so I'm really sorry about the black uh, screens and the components and boxes that were uh, showing up on the screen. I was trying to work on the feedback of people telling me this is not showing properly as the video was playing and I just couldn't figure it out. I'm really sorry. I think it's good now, but uh, yes, so the CTSI playback video is on the chat right now. Thank you so much. If you want to rewatch it on your own, um it's uh, definitely a great video to watch uh, i hope everybody was able to hear the sound as a minimum and then um uh, some of the some of these sorry about some of these boxes whatever I window right now like that's the window that's black like the one that we i just saw you move it it's probably the zoom yeah one. it's yes give me one second and i'll stop the sharing and i'll so what I'll do is I'll restart this because it's not supposed to do this, um, but I'll um, I'll restart my share so that way. Okay, that show the full screen now. Like, yeah, it looks good. Okay, let's go with this for now. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to make sure the main screen doesn't have anything on top of it, which is odd. But anyhow, anyhow. Um, so what are we going to do now is we're going to go into define and you remember uh, if we're in the design thinking process the first step was to discover and the next step is to define and define allows us to further converge our data so in order to do this we're going to use a canvas call an opportunity canvas. There are many different design thinking tools in order to take raw data like the sticky notes we just generated and then further converge them into something that's manageable and usable. Because right now, if you look at these boards, all of these sticky notes all over the place, it's, 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 it's some a person made a comment in the chat, like it's, it's a little chaotic, right? There's all this data all, so we need to start arranging it. We need to start refining it. We need to start converging it together. So an opportunity canvas gives us a chance to do this because it's a framework and um, a canvas that we use in order to take this raw data and start organizing it um, into specific dimensions. So that will give us more clarity out of the data. Right. So um, for the exercise number two, before you all go, uh, these are the instruction. You're going to go back to your Miro board, same board that you worked with because it's going to be the same breakout room. And so you're gonna go back to, let's say, breakout board number three or number four, et cetera. And this time you're gonna use the bottom template. So each board, if you've noticed, had a, a top template and a bottom template. So this, this time you're gonna use the bottom template. And there's a little bit of discussion that needs to happen within your group before you start putting elements on the templates. You need to look back at this data, take kind of a step back and say, what are some opportunities 
that could emerge out of this data. Again, for the design of designing for the future of higher level educations. What are some opportunities that sort of stand out out of this data set? And then you're gonna document these opportunities. I know there's a lot of stuff that could come out of data once we start looking at it. But if every group is able to document two to three design opportunities, I'm, I'm good with that. Like you don't need to like go overboard and say, you know, we're gonna extract everything. That's what I'm saying. There's a little bit of a discussion that needs to happen within your group before you start, because you need to look at that data and say, what are some of the salient data pieces in here? And brainstorm in your group, two or three opportunities that could emerge of that data. Again, we're not talking about like big ideas right now. We're not talking about implementation. We're not even looking whether these opportunities are doable or not doable or feasible. And we're not at that stage yet. We're just trying to further refine the raw data that we've collected in the exer in exercise number one. So I'll show you what that looks. So it's a canvas that has six different uh, boxes in it or component, right? The first box says, um, what opportunity exists for the future of teaching and learning out of that data set that's on top of that canvas? And this is where you're gonna just plainly state an opportunity. Which users will be impacted uh, by this, if this opportunity is addressed, right? Could be student, could be professors, could be administrators. What resources will we need to look at this opportunity further, right? We're kind of unpacking this, right? Uh, will technology be involved, if any, right? What are some of the risks and, con and constraints that we might be facing? And what are some of the outcomes that we could expect to achieve with that opportunity? What I'm gonna ask you to do for this one, if it makes sense, is use color coding as much as you can. Okay. So for example, here I have one opportunity, I'm using these red, pink sticky notes, and I'm kind of carrying that color throughout. So later on, when I read the canvas, I know that every sticky notes that's related to this, that's, that, that's color coded in that co particular color is related to this one opportunity here. And then I have a green opportunity, I use green sticky notes. And again, I'm carrying this out through the canvas. I'm hoping this makes sense to folks. It's just for an ease of use and ease of clarity once you wanna go back to that data later on. So if you have three opportunities, you'll have three colors. If you have two, you'll have two colors, right? And then you're carrying this through. So again, you're, it's very important, and this is a message that I have to my student quite a lot. <laughs> it's very important that this is informed by the data that you've collected because you don't wanna use all this data for, for, you don't wanna collect all this data and go through all this exercising of, of, of brainstorming data if you're not gonna make use of that data, right? So it's kind of a funnel model where you start large and you refine, but the refinement is based on what you've done before. So I'm gonna post these, and I'm sorry if there's gonna be a black screen here, I'll try not to, not to make it appear. <laughs> And then I'm gonna move it here, maybe that's might be better. <laughs> I'm gonna post these instructions on Zoom in the chat. So you have the instruction here at the top in PDF format. If you wanna refer back to them, you are going to have, you have the URL of the Miro board, which is the same URL as before. Go back to your board, work on the second template, bottom template, identified some opportunities for teaching and learning based on your data. Two to three per groups would be ideal. And then fill in the opportunity canvas. Again, we're gonna have volunteers and you're gonna be working with the same folks as you worked before. We're gonna have volunteers in the room to help you if you have some questions about that. So we will take a, yeah, we will take about a 25, 30 to 25 minutes. Let's start with 25 minutes, see where people are. And then uh, we'll, uh, 
we'll go from there. Great. Welcome back, everyone. We're almost at the end, just uh, enough time to conclude this opening plenary of the 15th annual CTSI Teaching and Learning Symposium. Uh, I was just looking at the boards, and I'm again, I'm amazed by the uh, opportunities that people have generated. Um, going back into Zoom here for a second, just to do a little bit of a quick playback overview. Um, and we could see here more flexible course delivery, more meaningful assessment, further faculty learner support, improving accessibility, which comes across quite often, creative digital content, great, uh, more familiarity with a variety of tools used in teaching and learning, um, uh, multiple engagement with UDL, accessibility UDL again, definitely a theme here that we've seen, flexibility, uh, office hours, guest uh, uh, hybrid learning, uh, leveraging students, social learning, collaborative tooling, engaging students with more flexible ways, work-life balance, great active learning, uh, active student participation, sorry, learning outcomes um, related to metacognition, uh, flexibility and pedagogy and kindness. Yeah, we need a lot of kindness <laughs> for sure. Uh, more flexibility in class delivery. So you could see here lots of good stuff that came out of these opportunity canvas, which are kind of derived from this data. I truly hope people had fun doing this um, and uh, they had fun generating all of this data. Uh, we definitely, I mean, again, like as, as uh, someone who runs the session, I, I can look at all the different boards and see people typing live. And uh, while most of you folks focus on your own board, uh, I was able to get like a 30,000 feet um, sort of overview. And it was just amazing to see all of this. So uh, great job, everyone. Uh, great participation too, like just amazing in terms of the level of participation. So um, let me just conclude here um, and say a few things. Um, first of all, we're going to lock this board in about 20 minutes or 15, 20 minutes. So if you have some last minute thoughts that you want to put in, go ahead, do it. But well, we're going to lock this board about 20 minutes and it's going to stay archived uh, which is what i was saying with, uh, during uh, to some of the ctsi folks while you guys were working on your <laughs> on your uh, boards one of the advantage of sometimes going digital is the archival is fairly easy right like once you do things in paper well the next classroom after you needs freshly wiped whiteboard and then so I always encourage my student takes lot, lots of pictures lots of pictures of your work because we're going to erase all this and delete all that but archival in the digital world is, is fantastic it's great so uh, anytime from now until whatever as long as CTSI decide that it's on and up you can refer back to this board you can go in take some ideas and read if, if you feel like you're you need some inspiration at some point in your teaching in the next couple of weeks or months or year, uh, just go back to this board and read the data and think about it as this is your data, right? Your data set is the data set that was created by folks in the, uh, in, in the teaching and learning symposium. So, um, so that's, that's great. Um, one thing I would like you to reflect on, and again, this is more like on, on a personal note, is I use a lot of these techniques in my classes. I teach them for students to better design new technologies or revamp current technologies, but I also use them quite a lot in my own teaching. So I hope that you, you it, it, was, it was fun to, to collaborate and get the data together and all. But another part of the reflection is how do I use this as in my own teaching, right? Uh, we, can, um, we can have one column uh, by using the currency pair and another is a premium currency. And, uh... and so um, use design thinking in your own course design or to get feedback from your student. So instead of doing a start, stop, continue on a survey monkey or on paper, 
uh, you know, and put it on Quarkus and say to the students, go re take time in week number six of your class, like in the last 25 minutes or 30 minutes and get students to do this. With, get, get your in person to give you a couple of packs of sticky notes and markers, right? Like it's, it's a lot of fun and, and do this live with the students and get them to play back play back what they think because when they play back they'll hear other students and you'll get the feedback and like right away but other students will hear what other students are thinking as well so you know and, and you can modify the stop start continue with with the question that we had today or some other types of questions that are more relevant you know keep it simple three questions collect the data group the data together and get the students to play it back you can also do this with your course feedback your course feedback um, that you get as part of your teaching evaluation at the end of the semester, you could create buckets like, what am I keeping in this course? What am I leaving in this course? And what am I looking forward to this course? And you lose, you use the course feedback from the students. That's what I do in my summer. <laughs> I actually create affinity diagrams and bucket of my course feedback and say, okay, this is what the students like and they want me to keep. This is what they want me to leave. Like, but instead of just reading the course feedback, organize it with sticky or whiteboard or digital, whether it's digital or physical. I also do this at the program level. So sometimes for the UX focused area of our master's of information, uh, some years I've called in a town hall uh, in April, all the students who are about to graduate in the concentration, like in what is this concentration taught you well, you think, or what do you wish you would have learned in this program that you didn't learn? Or if you've been into co-op, what did you wish you'd know before going into the co-op program that would really help you, right? And I ask the students to produce these affinity diagram and these boards and these maps as well. I have to say, I didn't do it this year because I felt like the students were so burnt out at the end of the semester, they were completely overwhelmed. So instead I've decided to do this little mini activity at reading week, but in the past couple of years, I've done these more like sort of town hall call where I'd say everybody who's graduating, if you're interested to contribute and give feedback to the program level, we're all gonna get into the studio at one o'clock on a Friday afternoon, and we're just gonna affinity diagram the program. And we're just gonna, use design thinking to refine the program right like um yes uh, megan great comment thank you so much um so yeah execute your design thinking journey think of these tools the last thing i'm going to encourage you to do is please 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 steal and use everything you want from the session today okay this is not my stuff like i did not invent this process it's it's not credited to me at all uh if you want to reuse some of these templates exercise myros if you want to customize things for your own course your own teaching all good i'm, I'm really hoping if there's one thing that some people will get away with some ideas of how to get feedback from their teaching and their courses using all this. So please reuse everything you've learned and you've seen today and, and just put your own grain of salt in there and, and just, just remix it for your own purpose, right? If you wanna get in touch with me, um, I'll put my email in the chat. Uh, I'm, I'm more than happy to talk to people. Uh, if you have an organization, a subgroup on campus, and you know you'd like me to go and do a design thinking, small design thinking session for um, for your subgroup and, and and get people going, I'm happy to run that as well to help give you feedback or to help you know like if you've put some templates together and some questions, if you want it to know whether it makes sense or not or how to run it, uh, no problem. This is this is really what I do, right? So. Um, so what's going to happen? Well, uh, we've, we're done the opening plenary. We have uh, finished the discovery stage. Um, we have done part of the define stage, right? So we've started defining some things with looking at opportunities. In the next uh, few hours from one o'clock onwards this afternoon, I got a, a bunch of busy student volunteers who are going to come with me online behind the scene and digest all of this and we're going to create a gallery view of opportunity canvases which are going to be all cleaned up and and 
and merge all together. We're going to remove the, the repetitive data and all that. And we're going to create this gallery view of, um, of uh, opportunity canvases. Tomorrow, we're going to start the session at 9 AM on design thinking. It's really is an ideation session. So we're going to start with these canvases, that gallery view, and say, what are some of the big ideas that we can generate? Like some people talk about better accessibility. OK, what are some of the ideas around that that we can unpack? So we're going to further unpack these, these opportunity canvases. And I'll introduce you to big idea generation, a big idea template, and a prioritization grid template. And so we're going to be at this point uh, right here in the process where we have finished to define and we're starting to create. And then at that point, uh, it will be the end of the data collection and generation for this symposium. And on Friday afternoon, we will present all of these ideas in a big idea gallery view template to uh, members, to, to you folks, but also to members of the uh, administrative um, administration of the university. And we can have a panel where people can comment on these things and give us their thoughts. So, I'm glad to say that it worked out and I got amazing data <laughs> and I got good enough data to carry on to tomorrow. So that was my biggest worry because <laughs> I just don't know what's gonna come out out of this, but it's amazing. The data is great, the ideas are great. It's gonna be great. So tomorrow morning, if you wanna join us, uh, there'll be some details about that in a few seconds. I really want to thank you all for participating in those difficult times. I know online adds some different challenges and some other um, constraint at times, but I really, really enjoyed doing this. It was a, a great honor and privilege to, to, to be running this opening plenary for the symposium. And I thank you all for being such amazing participants. Thank you so much. Can we all give Olivier a massive hand, huge round of applause. This, I'm sure you can see the work and the thinking that went into this. This was so much work for Olivier and his students to put together. Most, you know, it was a huge collaborative effort, but it was a lot of work. So, and it was huge fun. So thank you, Olivier, very much. And thank you to all of you for your wonderful participation this morning. That is one busy board. So I do not want to be the uh, barrier between you and lunch and the next concurrent session, which is starting in about half an hour at 1230. That's when the first concurrent session opens. So I'm going to quickly go through my housekeeping announcements, and then we can let you all go and, and get to your lunch. Just a few notes about how to navigate the website and the program for the symposium. Um, you can create a personal timetable and print it off through EVE, which is the registration system that we use for the symposium. Please engage with the videos, the asynchronous content that, that is on the symposium website. People went to a lot of work to design their posters and the videos that accompany the posters. So please take a look at those, particularly before you go to a concurrent session that focuses on the posters. Um, there's wonderful content there from your colleagues. And do talk to each other in the forum. Forum. If you really liked the design thinking process that you were taking through this morning, engage with it, unpack it, talk about it a little bit more, talk about some of the ideas that you saw in the session this morning in the forum. Um, we invite you to do that. Next slide, please, Kelly. Oh, sorry. And that's so that icon on the landing page of the symposium website is where you go if you have any questions about anything, including technical help. So that's where you go if you want to collect, connect with other people or if you need help, you can just pop in there. Some notes about um, the concurrent sessions. We are not recording them. So the default setting is that we're not recording the concurrent sessions. We are recording the plenary. So the opening plenary today was recorded and the closing plenary on Friday will be recorded not the concurrent sessions, however. So you're not going to be able to access that information after the symposium. Um, some special sessions. There's a roundtable with our uh, finalists for the Institutional uh, Teaching Excellence Award for Course Instructors that's offered through the TATP. These are senior, very gifted, very talented graduate student course instructors who are going to be sharing their strategies and insights in a special roundtable. There's We've already talked about the other design thinking session that is happening tomorrow at nine o'clock. And there's also a round table led by our president's teaching award winners. So these are people who have won the PTA award. That's the highest teaching honor at U of T. They're leading a round 
roundtable where you can just pop in. And if you want to get into some problems or some challenges with them and throw around some ideas for how to work through those, through those challenges, they are there to help you. It's like a doctor is in session. The PTA uh, winners are in. They're going to be there to answer your questions and do some creative problem solving. Don't forget to tweet. How wonderful the opening plenary was this morning. Do share your tweets. Um, there's the hashtag on the screen. Uh, we want to see lots of discussion and lots of um, ideas floating through the, the chat for the and floating through the uh, tw Twitter. The bird app. Okay, anything else? Kelly, CTSI team, anything else? Olivier? So the session, the session tomorrow is full uh, tomorrow morning. However, yes. I believe Kelly was mentioning if some people want to attend, there's a way to do so still. Yes, sorry, Olivia, I forgot to mention that. Folks oh, yeah. who are interested uh, to, in attending tomorrow morning's design thinking session, it will appear full if you try to register for it. But if you send us an email to tls at utoronto.ca, I'll put that in the chat, we will make sure that you are able to attend. We especially want all the folks who are here this morning to be able to continue the conversation. So not a problem, just let us know and we'll get you in the event. Thank you, Kelly. And the reason we are asking you to do that directly with us instead of us just opening the cap is because Olivier and I are trying to manage the size of that session because the discussion is going to be more focused. It's about drilling down and consolidating the information. So we don't want a huge session. But to Kelly's point, if you were in the plenary this morning and you're really engaged and you want to join that session, we will let you in, but you need to reach out to us directly. Okay. Any other thoughts, ideas, questions, issues, or are we good? Because we are at 12.04 and you need to eat your lunch. Yay, well done, everybody. Fantastic okay. session. <laughs> Go into the world, have your break, step outside. It's gorgeous outside. And then come back at 12.30 for the next concurrent session. And we'll see you around. Olivier Thanks will be in the session tomorrow morning. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye.